Hello and welcome to space and this month we're taking you out to the furthest reaches of our solar system to this place, the dwarf planet Pluto. It turns out to be far more weird than anyone ever expected, with all kinds of unexplained phenomena on the surface. We sought out some of Europe's finest ice planet experts to find out more. Pluto has been a mystery since it was discovered in 1930. First called a planet, then reclassified as a dwarf planet in 2006, the more we learn, the more it captures the imagination of scientists like ESA's Elliot Sefton Nash. One of the important things you should understand about Pluto is the real scale of it compared to the rest of the solar system. So we've come to the beach to really convey that, that scale and distance. So if I draw the sun, as a 30 centimetre circle, then we have to walk about 35 steps this way in order to draw the Earth in the same type of scale. So the Sun is over there at 30 centimetres, which means that the Earth should be about here, about three millimetres, something like this. If we were to draw Pluto in the same scale, it should be 0.3 millimetres, and it should be one kilometre down the beach. Now obviously I can't draw something that's 0.3 millimetres, so I have to draw Pluto a bit bigger. If this is Pluto, then its largest moon is Charon, which is about half its size. But Pluto has four other moons, Styx, Nix, Kerberos and Hydra. So there's a lot going on around the Pluto system. It's not just a cold, dead, icy rock. Humanity had its first close-up view of Pluto in 2015, when NASA's New Horizons probe flew past the dwarf planet and its moons. What it witnessed was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Scientists working on New Horizons like Bernard Schmidt and Tongi Bertrand were spellbound. They were seeing a distant world that didn't resemble the rocky planets Earth or Mars, nor the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. Pluto is different. When New Horizons arrived at Pluto, we were struck by the topography. Why? Because you've mountains that reach up to four kilometers high, and you have this huge basin which is three kilometers below the average surface height. Those are enormous topographical differences for a small body like Pluto. The six gigabytes of images and scientific measurements slowly sent back by New Horizons are now filling in the gaps in our knowledge of Pluto. What the team is finding as they dig into that data is a world dominated by ice. Bernard and Tongi took us to a frozen lake near Grenoble and cleared the snow to allow us to compare what we see here on Earth with what has been discovered on Pluto. The water ice here is close to zero degrees, like in all the glaciers here in the Alps. So it's relatively soft, it flows and forms glaciers. But on Pluto, this water ice is at minus 230 degrees Celsius and it's as hard as rock. So on Pluto, it's water that forms the mountain ranges. So the mountains on Pluto are water ice, occasionally dappled with patches of methane frost, while the huge heart-shaped glacier on its surface is made from nitrogen. Scientists think Pluto has strong seasonal cycles too, which could explain some of the unusual features on its surface. The equator is an enigma. There are no volatile ices, it's just the base of water ice covered in a kind of soot. This black material that's produced by the photolysis of the ice by UV rays, so there's a huge contrast between the dark zones of the equator and the bright areas in the north and this gigantic glacier of nitrogen ice that's the size of France. That glacier known as Sputnik Planitia is thought to be under a million years old, a remarkably young age by planetary standards. Nobody has agreed on an explanation for how it was formed and how it's renewed. Understanding Pluto can really help us understand the solar system as a whole, so scientists think there's a strong case to go there again. I think it would be fantastic to send a lander to really understand 
Uh, first of all, the, the structures and the, the mineralogy up close, but also to observe it over a longer time period. Because we've only seen Pluto in a very, a, you know, an instant of its orbit. And so there might, the seasonal changes might be very dynamic if we could watch it for a whole year. It's a strange place, and so you really want to simulate this world, do experiments, try to understand how it works, because there's a kind of climate, there's an atmosphere on Pluto, there are ices, but it's not at all like Earth. Nobody imagined we'd find such a dynamic planet so far from the Sun. We're left with a lot more questions, but a space mission that poses more questions than it answers is a successful mission. Just a few years ago, Pluto and its moons were nothing but a few pixels in our telescopes, mysterious dots in the asteroid belt beyond Neptune. Now we know it better, and we're curious to know more. Away from Pluto now and to our new mini-series, Legends of Space. Throughout 2017, we're celebrating 60 years since Sputnik by looking at some of the greatest moments in space exploration. And this month, we look to April 1961, when Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. I'm always impressed when I look at the life of Gagarin, uh, how hard a life he had had. I mean, he came from a very modest uh, family. A young man, he was 27 years of age when he did his flight on the 12th of April 1961. It was an extremely risky operation, and that's what we loved about it back then. I was young, just 24, and it seemed extraordinary. And it was. Gagarin stands very high in the minds of astronauts and cosmonauts, and uh, in the International Space Station you have a portrait of Gagarin who is there and looking at all of the occupants of, uh, of ISS. The risk, the success, and then Gagarin's charisma. He was likeable, he was young, he was the son of a potato farmer, so he was perfect for Khrushchev. It was a real demonstration of what a Soviet astronaut could be. <laughs> That's all for now. You can watch other episodes of Legends of Space and keep up to date with other news from the universe on our website on euronews.com.